والله يدعو الى دار السلام ويهدي من يشاء الى صراط مستقيم Allah knows what's best for us so why should we complain we always want the sunshine but he knows there must be rain we always want the laughter and the merriment of cheer but our hearts will lose their tenderness If we never shed a tear So whenever we feel that Everything's going wrong It is just Allah's way To make our spirits strong Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh All praise is due to Allah, we praise Him, we seek His aid and we ask for His forgiveness. We seek refuge in Allah from the evils of ourselves and the evil consequences of our actions. Whomsoever Allah guides, none can lead astray. And whomsoever Allah leaves to go astray, none can guide. I bear witness that none has the right to be worshipped but Allah alone. Who has no partners and I bear witness that Muhammad وسلم, is his servant and his messenger. Welcome to a new episode of Inspirations. We're still trying our best to relive the seerah, the biography of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. And I believe we've spent very precious time trying to get ourselves personally involved in the events, trying to relive them, trying to bring them back to life again seeing them as vivid as they happened, at least to the best of our ability, and trying to draw lessons from that. So hopefully, we will be able to take the example of the Prophet ﷺ and also learn from his companions. Last time we were in the middle of the Battle of Badr, and we were talking about the great event, the important event of two teenagers, two Muslim teenagers man- who, have, who managed to take out and to put down one of the great one of the most important and most vicious leaders of disbelief Abu Jahl the enemy of Al Islam whom the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam called the pharaoh of this nation the pharaoh of this ummah he's the pharaoh because he was very arrogant very adamant and he uh, persecuted the muslims tortured them and gave them very hard time We said these two two teenagers were among the heroes of Islam who managed to kill Abu Jahl and destroy him. Although he was surrounded with a human shield by the soldiers of disbelief. And we said Abu Jahl with all his arrogance, all his persecutions, all his evil history, now he's on the dust. Now he's under the feet of the people. No one looks at Abu Jahl now. Where is his idols? Where is his gods that he used to worship? Where are, where are they? Nothing, to, nothing helped him. All of these were of no avail. So all his efforts came to naught. There was no benefit. There was no positive results. Abu Jahl lived this life in arrogance, disbelief and filth. And so he died as an insignificant animal. No one paid attention to Abu Jahl, Abu Jahl after he fell on the ground and he was striving against death. But yet, his destiny, and he was destined to die on the battlefield of Badr. So these two great young companions rushed to the Prophet ﷺ straight away and they each one of them said, Oh Messenger of Allah, I have killed Abu Jahl, I've killed Abu Jahl. They were so happy that each one of them has, ful- has fulfilled his oath, has fulfilled his promise to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they would either kill Abu Jahl or he would kill them. So they rushed to the Prophet ﷺ, giving him the glad tidings, Oh Messenger of Allah, and actually, Uh, we will postpone talking about this because it 
in reality happened straight after the battle. And we will see what the Prophet ﷺ will say about Abu Jahl, especially after seeing his body. Another one, another leader among the leaders of Quraysh, one of the most vicious enemies of Islam, one of the worst and most evil people of Quraysh, has fell off his horse, has fell off his horse, but he did not die. He was not killed. Rather, he was taken as captive. He was, he was imprisoned by one of the heroes of Islam, so he was dragged, full with humiliation, apparent on his face. And maybe, probably, when he was dragged by one of the heroes of Islam, and he was showered with humiliation, humiliation that came from his challenge to Islam and to the Muslims, from the torture that he inflicted on the Muslims, Probably he remembered his old days when he used to persecute the Muslims, insult the Prophet ﷺ, abuse him. Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt. Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt was dragged and put in and was captivated by the Muslims. Probably he remembered the days when he came to the Prophet ﷺ, or, or when, when he had come to the Prophet ﷺ, who had been praying next to Al Kaaba. He came to him and he pulled the Prophet's garment from behind and he twisted it trying to strangle the Prophet. He wanted, he wanted to kill him at that moment. Why? Because he was praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just next to Al Kaaba. Because he was saying, La ilaha illallah. And he was about to kill the Messenger. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused Abu Bakr to come and he pushed him away and he said, Do you kill a person? And Abu Bakr was actually crying. He said, do you kill a person? Because he is saying that my Lord is Allah. Because he's saying no one has the right to be worshipped. But Allah, do you kill him? Uqba ibn, ibn Abi Mu'ayd, that evil person. And some narrations indicate, some indications and some other narrations indicate that uh, if you used to remember the incident where the Prophet ﷺ was praying next to Al-Kaaba and when he was prostrating. And Abu Jahl said, you know, there is the clan of so-and-so, they had a feast last day. They slaughtered a camel, or a she-camel. Who can bring the intestine of this she-camel, which stinks? Who would bring it and put it on the back of Muhammad when he, wa- when he is making prostration? The narration say one of the most evil people of that group did it. And most probably that was Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt. He held the intestine with and the filth that they contained, and he put it on the back of the, of the Prophet ﷺ, who was making sujood to Allah. And then they burst and laugh, laughing and making fun of the Prophet ﷺ, who remained made in his prostration until someone went to Fatima, the daughter of the Prophet ﷺ, and told her what had happened. She went and she took that away from the back of the Prophet ﷺ. And then she started uh, blaming these people of Quraysh. So the Prophet ﷺ finished his prayer, then he looked at them, and then he turned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he said, O oh Allah, destroy the people of Quraysh, these people of Quraysh, he means the mushrikeen. O oh Allah, destroy Utba ibn Abi Rabi'ah. O oh Allah, destroy Abu Jahl. O oh Allah, destroy Shayba ibn Rabi'ah. O oh Allah, destroy Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he's the one who, who actually narrated this incident. Uh, who reported this incident, he said, I wish I could take, I wish I could go and take that, or remove that, the intestine from the back of the Prophet ﷺ, but I had no one to support me. And I was afraid if I did that, if I had done that, somebody would do something bad to me. So he's the one who narrates that. So he said, the Prophet ﷺ, oh, said, Oh Allah, destroy Abu Jahl. Oh Allah, destroy Uqba uh, ibn Abi Mu'ayyad. Oh Allah, destroy Utba ibn, Sh- ibn Rabi'ah, Shayba ibn Rabi'ah, and so on. So for seven people, he supplicated against seven people. He said, when they heard the Prophet ﷺ supplicating Allah subhanahu wa making dua against them, they were taken by fear. They were taken by fear. Because they realized that the dua was accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, inshallah we will mention this again, he said, I saw all these people killed in the battle of Badr. These seven people, the most evil people. So Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt was not killed now, so far, 
but he was taken as captive by one of the heroes of Islam, another one, another vicious person, vicious enemy against Islam, one of the worst leaders of Mecca, the person who's been living in fear for quite, for quite some time now, Umayyah ibn Khalaf. Umayyah who was given the news by Sa'd ibn Mu'ad that Muhammad Sallallahu said that they were going to kill you. So he did not, he had not, he did not want to go to join the army of Quraysh in the battle of Badr. He didn't want to do that, but he was forced. He was embarrassed. He was cornered by Abu Jahl. But now Abu Jahl is dead. So Umayyah was taken by fear. And in the middle of the battle, one of the heroes of Islam pushed him and he caused him to fall off his horse or his, fall off his camel. And Umayyah was known to be a very stout kind of person. He was obese. He was... Uh, very uh, big kind of person. So he fell on the ground and, and he was taken by fear because he was expecting death at any moment. And there was another person who fell, Ali. Ali fell next to him and his sword fell off his hand and he was taken by fear. But what caused Ali to fall? Actually, it was one of the soldiers of Islam who caused Ali, pushed Ali, and he caused him to fall off his horse. But why would a Muslim cause Ali or push Ali and cause him to fall off his horse? What does he want to do with Ali? And why was Ali so frightened? He was taken by fear. Ali is one of the heroes of Islam. The reason is very simple. The answer is very simple. That was not Ali ibn Abi Talib. It wasn't Ali. Ali ibn Abi Talib was one of the lions of Islam fighting the mushrikeen. No one could stand in his face. So which Ali was this? That was the son of Umayyah ibn Khalaf. Ali ibn Umayyah ibn Khalaf. He was the son of Umayyah ibn Khalaf. He was a coward like his father. So he was taken by fear. Now at this moment, Umayyah realized that death was approaching, death was coming, and that was his ultimate fear. He didn't want to be killed by the Muslims. He wanted to enjoy this life more. So at that moment, he lost all hope in life. He realized that death was coming, death was coming, death was coming. He he looked around, he wanted to run away. And all of a sudden, he sees one of the heroes of Islam, Abdul Rahman ibn Awf again. Abdul Rahman ibn Awf coming with his sword full with blood, having killed so many of the enemies of Islam, so many of the evil people of the polytheists from among Quraysh. But Umayyah ibn Khalaf, seeing that horrible and that frightening scene of Abdul Rahman ibn Awf coming with his sword, which is full with blood, holding some armors that he has uh, wrapped or he has uh, uh, put them together and he's holding them with a rope, he's dragging them with a rope. Seeing this frightening scene of a Muslim hero who could have just killed them with one hit by his sword, Umayy ibn Khalaf in the middle of this fear of death, taken by that fear of death, all of a sudden sees some hope. He sees some hope in life again. But that's really strange. Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, a Muslim, strong Muslim, very strong fighter, having killed so many of these mushrikeen, he's coming now to Umayyah, but yet Umayyah sees hope in him. He sees life coming. He sees Abdul Rahman ibn Awf holding life and bringing it to him. That's really strange. There must be a secret. Umayyah ibn Khalaf looked at Abdul Rahman and he saw these armors in his hand. He said, these armors are nothing. I am better for you than these armors. Why don't you take me as a captive? Imagine, he saw some hope in Abdul Rahman ibn Awf that he could save him from death. But why? Let's ask Abdul Rahman ibn Awf himself. Abdul Rahman, why does Umayyah ibn Khalaf has hope in you? He expects to be killed by any of these Muslims. But why not Abdul Rahman ibn Awf? Why not you? Abdul Rahman ibn Awf tells us the story. It goes back to even before the arrival of Islam, before the advent of Islam. He, he says, in the days of Jahiliyyah, my name was Abdu Amr, the slave of Amr. And I was a very close friend of Umayyah ibn Khalaf. 
We used to make trade together. We used to be two businessmen. So when the Prophet ﷺ was sent and I accepted Islam, I changed my name into Abdul Rahman. So Umayy ibn Khalaf said to me, I don't know Ar Rahman. I don't know Ar Rahman that you are the slave of Ar Rahman, Abdul Rahman, Abdul Rahman. I will call you Abdul Amr. Then he said to me, Umayy ibn Khalaf said to Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, Do you turn away from the name that has been given to you by your father? He said, Yes. I embraced Islam, Islam and I'm the slave of Ar Rahman, the slave of Allah. He said, but he never called me Abdul Rahman. He always called me Abdul Amr. Now after Hijra, Abdul Rahman obviously made Hijra to Medina. He said, I maintain those relations, the business relationship between me and Umayyah ibn Khalaf. And I sent him a book. I sent him a letter. I said to him, I look after your business here in Medina and you look after my business there in Mecca because I can't go to Mecca. And that was an agreement. And by the way, this hadith is in Sahih al-Bukhari. So there is no harm in business transactions, business deals with a Muslim and a non-Muslim. Even if the two countries are in a state of war, but I have business relations with a person from that country, as long as it does not have any negative impact on the Muslims, or on the Muslim state, or on the welfare of the Muslims, or on the balance of power. There is no harm in that. Sometimes people, without knowledge, talk about things that are halal. halal. They claim that they are haram. So Abdul Rahman ibn Awf had this agreement with Umayyah. He said, you observe, you look after my business there in Mecca, I look after your business there in Medina. And they used to have correspondence, they used to write to each other, and look after each other's business. But still, Umayy ibn Khalaf refused any letter that I sent to him in the name of Abdul Rahman. He always said to me, write to me as Abdu Amr. So that was the story uh, before Islam and after Islam. Now what happened in the Battle of Badr as Umayy ibn Khalaf saw some hope when he saw Abdul Rahman ibn Awf. This is something we will find out about inshallah after this short break. So stay with us. It is just Allah's way to make our spirits strong. It is just Allah's way to make our spirits strong. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Inspirations. We are still trying our best to live with the events of the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, trying to learn as much as possible and trying to improve ourselves as Muslims, trying to improve ourselves in terms of faith, Iman, and in terms of knowledge about our way of life and our Prophet. May the, blessing, may the blessings and peace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be upon him. I would like to, write, to re remind you to write to us. You can write to us on our email address, inspirations at huda.tv. The email address again is inspirations at huda.tv and as I say all your emails are welcome and thank you for your contributions and be patient even if we don't write to you. We do read our, your emails and we do appreciate them and try to benefit from them. Your comments, your suggestions always add to the content of the show and the quality of the show in terms of technical matters as well. So may Allah reward you. Uh, just before the break we were talking about something that happened with Umayyah ibn Khalaf in the battle of Badr after he was pushed off his camel. He fell down, was taken by fear. His son Ali was also taken by fear. Two cowards, two of the worst people among the Quraysh, among the Meccan people, Meccan polytheists. Uh, they were in real danger. And Umayyah ibn Khalaf had this psychological knot 
not of being killed by the Muslims because he'd been given the news that he was going to be killed by the Muslims and he realized that Muhammad sallallahu says the truth and if he says something it will come to be true. So he was all he was taken by fear, he was overwhelmed by fear that death was going to come to him at any moment. And in the middle of that fear, he saw that hope in Abdul Rahman ibn Awf. Although the scene doesn't really suggest any hope, but as I said, there was a secret behind that. It was the special relationship between Abdul Rahman ibn Awf and Umayyah. We asked Abdul Rahman ibn Awf about that relation. He told us about what had happened in Mecca, how the relationship had been, and about the business relationship between him and Umayyah even after. Hijrah. Now when Umayyah ibn al-Khalaf saw Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, he said to him, leave these armors, they're nothing. Because Abdul Rahman ibn Awf has taken them as spoils of war. And he didn't want to lose them. He said to them, I will give you something better, just take me as a captive. And then you can take the ransom. Or you, you will take a huge share of it. So Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, or the, when first Umayyah saw him, he said to him, leave these things, take me. Don't you want to get some milk? Because ransom at that time to ransom and free a, uh, a captive or a prisoner of war people used to pay either in money gold and silver or they used to pay in sheep or camels uh, so Abdur, uh, Umayyah ibn Khalaf said to Abdul Rahman don't you want to get some milk because he he was insinuating that you would get you know camels of of my wealth, because Umayyah was a very rich, per, very rich person. He said, you would get of my camels and you can enjoy the milk that you will get from them. So, Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, or actually just before that, let me mention this beautiful thing, that when Umayyah saw Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, uh, he said to him, Ya Abd Amr, he called him with his old name, Abdul Amr. Abdul Rahman ibn Awf said, I turned away from him. I, didn't, I ignored him. So he said, Ya Abd al-Ilah, Slave of the Lord, slave of Allah, the true God. Ya Abd al Ilah, he said, then I looked at him. And this that conversation took place. He said, I'm better for you than these armors, just leave them and take me as a captive. So Abdul Rahman uh, Abdul Rahman ibn Awf thought about that. So he said, Okay, let me take him to the side of this of the battlefield and I can tie him and I can keep him as a captive. And he would be one of the captives that the Muslims would take from that war. So he took him and his son. He took him away because he didn't want him to be killed. Because to win in the battle uh, or any kind of victory was ca calculated or was counted or was deemed by how many people of the enemy would fall as casualties or how many of them were to be captivated. And actually some or most people would prefer to get more captives because captives, especially in the state of the Muslims at that time, a captive would mean to get the ransom. And that would strengthen the Muslims financially because they were suffering at that time. So, Abdul Rahman ibn Rauf took them. And at that moment, Umayyah ibn Khalaf could breathe freely. Now he felt that he was saved from death. He felt the safety after he thought that he was going to be killed, now he's breathing freely and he's feeling that he has been saved. So he's feeling safe, but all of a sudden, all this safety was destroyed by one scream. One scary and frightening scream came from one side, and that was Bilal. Bilal, he screamed, he said, Umayyah ibn Khalaf. Umayyah ibn Khalaf. What did Umayyah ibn Khalaf do? He was the one torturing Bilal in Mecca because he was the master of Bilal he was he's, he's the person who, you, who did all that evil to Bilal and if you used to remember we said they used to whip him under the scorching sun in the heat of Mecca on the burning sands of Mecca and he used to rip off his clothes and leave him naked sleep naked on the burning sands and then whip him with his uh, whip him really hard, and then he would cause the young mushrikeen, the young children of Mecca, to drag Bilal naked in the streets of Mecca. And then he would 
bring huge stones, put them on the stomach and on the chest of Bilal. And this, the narrations tell us that when Abu Bakr came to buy Bilal from Umayyah in order to free him, to free him from that torture, to free him from that tribulation, he came and he paid the price of Bilal to Umayyah ibn Khalaf. When he came to him, he was searching for Bilal, he couldn't find him. And then he found him under a pile of huge stones. Bilal was, has disappeared under the stones. That was the kind of torture that Umayyah used to inflict on Bilal. So Bilal saw him now and he screamed, he said, Umayyah ibn Khalaf, I shall not make it, may I not make it ever if he makes it. If he remains alive, I don't want to remain alive. And then he ran after him. And some of the Ansar, and Bilal called some of the Ansar, come, this is the enemy of Allah, this is Umayyah ibn Khalaf, let's go and get him. Now, Abdul Rahman ibn Awf wanted to keep him as a captive because he wanted to get the spoils of war for the Muslims because that meant a lot of money. And that would actually, that was counted as one point on the side of the Muslims. But Bilal had another plan. So they all chased them. So Abdul Rahman ibn Awf said, I tried to keep Umayyah. So in order to keep Bilal and the other Ansar busy, I left the son of Umayyah, I left him for them. And I was dragging Umayyah, who was a very big person, huge person, big body. Uh, so I, I left Ali, his son, so he could keep them away. Maybe I could just take Umayyah and put him in a safe place. So he said, I took him, but I couldn't. They killed his son, then they started chasing Umayyah. He said, I let Umayyah sleep on the ground and I tried to put myself up on top of him, trying just to keep him, trying to convince Bilal, keep him, He's going, we are going to benefit from him. But Bilal was determined to destroy that man who did so much evil to all the early Muslims. So Bilal again screamed, he said, may I not make it, may I not remain alive if he, if he doesn't die. And then they all jumped on him and they killed him, they stabbed him. With the swords, they cut him. And actually, Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, when he was trying to stop them, he got his uh, leg cut as well. They wounded him, uh, obviously without, uh, you know, without not deliberately, but he got wounded. Then Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, and this is in Sahih al-Bukhari, when he mentions this, he says, "May Allah forgive Bilal. I left the armors that I had uh, collected, that I had made." from the fight in order to get Umayyah. Then he made me lose Umayyah and he made me lose all the spoils that I was uh, planning to get from that person. So now there is no, there was, the hope was over for Umayyah and he paid the price of all the oppression that he inflicted on the Muslims. And Bilal took the revenge. First of all, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of that enemy, that person who never wanted any good for Islam and who did so much evil to the Prophet ﷺ and the rest of the early Muslims. Another enemy of Islam falls. Abu Jahl first, Uqba ibn Abu, Abi Mu'ayyit and Umayyah ibn Khalaf. Where is the arrogance? Where is the pride? Where is the power that they used to brag about? Where is the disbelief that they used to be proud about? Where is that? It's all gone. Where are their idols that they used to worship? Why didn't they benefit them? No. Umayyah ibn Khalaf died. His son Ali also died. And you could imagine what his wife, or how his wife would behave when she hears the news about her husband and her son being killed and falling in the battle of Badr. Now, Umayyah, or the prophecy of the Prophet ﷺ that Umayyah ibn Khalaf was going to be killed by the Muslims, now it has come true, and one of these vicious enemies of Islam has gone forever. And this will be the end of all of the enemies of Islam. Maybe they can do whatever they want for some time, they managed to torture Muslims. They managed to persecute Muslims. They managed to cause so much harm to Muslims and to Islam. But their end will be dark. As the end of Abu Jahl. As the end of Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayyit. As the end of 
Umayy ibn Khalaf. Uqba ibn Abu Ma'ayyat was said, we has, he hadn't been killed at that time yet. But he's been taken as captive. So anyone who oppresses Islam and, Muslim, anyone, and Muslims, anyone who stands in the face of the Islamic da'wah, he will pay the price. If not in this life, it will be even worse in the hereafter. So that will be the end of all of the oppressors. So Mu'a Abdul Rahman ibn Auf tried to get uh, Umayyah ibn Khalaf and put him in, in, a, in a safe place, keep him there in order then to take him as a captive. But Bilal did not give him any chance. One of the young Muslim fighters, Umayr ibn Abi Waqqas. Umayr is the younger brother of Sa'd, Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas. He was a young boy, a young man, and he was martyred. He died in the Battle of Badr. One of the young Muslims died to be one of the martyrs of the Battle of Badr. Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas realized that. So this is why he, why he was fighting strongly and bravely to the extent that Abdullah ibn Mas'ud saw him and he was surprised and he said, I saw Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas fighting as if he was two people fighting together. He was fighting like a riding knight as he was riding on a horse and he was fighting as a person who was on his, on his feet. He, was, he did so much damage to the army of the Mushrikeen. Another of the great heroes of Islam was Az Zubayr. Az Zubayr ibn al Awam, he came across one of the Mushrikeen, one of the most evil Mushrikeen, Ubayd ibn Sa'd ibn al As. Ubayd ibn Sa'd ibn al As was a very huge person in terms of his body and his physique. He was a very strong person. He was called Abu Dhat al Karsh, the father of the belly, because he had a huge belly. But he was fully armored. He had a full armor covering all parts of his body apart from his eyes, just for a small opening for his eyes. So no one actually could kill him. As Zubayr ibn Awam, one of the heroes of Islam, he was fighting against this Abu Dhat al Karsh, the father of the belly, and he stabbed him on his eyes and he killed him and he died. So the Muslims did a really wonderful job was one of the most important, most beautiful, most critical times in the history of Islam. The Muslims realized that they were winning the battle. So they, the morale went really up now. And the results were revealing themselves that the Muslims were winning the battle. The Muslims were winning the battle. The Mushrikeen realized that they were losing the battle. So they resorted to one technique. They resorted to one move holding their last hope in the battle. What was that move? We will find out about it, inshallah, after this short break, so stay tuned. It is just Allah's way to make our spirits strong. The Muslims in particular will uh, have very good knowledge of Islamic religion and Islamic law and then will run their lives according to the injunctions of Allah. It will enable them to know how to live peacefully with them and at the same time practice Islamic religion or follow the injunctions of Allah as requested and required by the Allah. <laughs> Just Allah's way to make our spirits strong. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Inspirations. The Muslims were winning the Battle of Badr. And the results were going or were in the favor of the Muslims. The Muslims realized that fact and also the polytheists. So they tried to or they resorted to one move that could alter the scales of the battle. Now they gathered themselves together and they decided to put the Muslims under pressure. So they, f they pushed with their full force against the Muslims. It, that was one of the most difficult times of the battle, but the Muslims remained brave. They never turned back on their heels. 
and but yet at some difficult moments the Muslims couldn't face the strength of the enemy but what happened they used to take shelter behind one of or the most or the bravest and the strongest hero of the battle of Badr who was that hero was it Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib was it Ali ibn Abi Talib or was it Zubair ibn Awam or Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas or Umar ibn Khattab or Abu Bakr or these or any of these great heroes of Islam no the bravest fighter the strongest fighter on the battle of Badr was the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ali ibn Abi Talib tells us, he says, as at the darkest moment, at the most difficult moments, in the battle of Badr, when we couldn't really stand in the face of the enemy, we would seek the shelter behind the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was the strongest fighter in the battle of Badr. That's the bravest man. That's the best example. A perfect leader. In terms of the simplicity, the simple way he deals with his companions, with his... Uh, f- with the soldiers and still he would fight as they fought he was the best example of a leader so the Prophet ﷺ was the bravest man in the battle of Badr but something else and after seeing the strength of the Prophet ﷺ, the Mushrikeen or their morale the morale of the Mushrikeen went really down and they realized that they were losing the battle and there was no way, they had no chance of winning the battle of Badr. And something that really helped destroy their spirit completely was some individuals of them realized that the Muslims were not by themselves. They were not fighting only by themselves. There was somebody, there was somebody, some, some other people fighting with them, some other soldiers fighting with them. Jubair ibn Mut'im ibn Uday, you remember Mut'im ibn Uday, this person who helped the Prophet ﷺ on some occasions, but yet he died as a mushrik. His son was called Jubair. He was in the army of Quraysh fighting against the Muslims. He himself says that I saw in the battle of Badr when I was fighting, when I was a mushrik. Now he's saying this years later after he has become a Muslim. He says that I was in the battle of Badr and I saw in the skies, I, saw, I looked up and I saw something like a black mat or black carpet coming and I realized that these were the angels. I realized that the Muslims were not fighting by themselves. They were supported and aided. And he said, I realized that these were the angels. He realized the uh, truth. One of the great companions, Abu Waqid al-Layfi. Abu Waqid al-Layfi was fighting in the battle of Badr against the Mushrikeen and he, when he was fighting with one of those mushrikeen, that mushrik ran away. So Abu Waqid al Laythi chased him. And he said, I was about to cut off his head. I was, actually, I moved my hand to cut off his head. But all of a sudden, his head was cut off like that by itself. Before I touched him. He said, I knew that it was an angel. That was one of the angels killed that uh, kill that mushrik or that polytheist. Another Muslim says that I was fighting against one of the mushrikeen and all of a sudden I heard a sound of a whip. As if someone whipped him. Then I looked at his face and I saw that his face turned green and blue. It was the same mark made if someone was whipped on his face. Then I looked that his face was cut into two pieces. Then I realized that it was one of the angels that hit him. And he said just prior to that, prior to the, this mushrik being hit by, or by being whipped on his face like that, I heard someone, I heard a sound from above saying, Go on Hayzoom. And this hadith is narrated by Muslim and Al-Bayhaqi. Go on Hayzoom. We don't know what Hayzum was it one of the angels? Was it one of the riding animals the angels had? We don't know. But he said, I heard, go on Hayzum, and then that mushrik was hit or was whipped like that. Another incident as well, because we know in the, in the uh, camp of the mushrikeen, they were Al-Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ. He had to join the mushrikeen. He couldn't. Otherwise, he would have seen as uh, a traitor 
against the people of Mecca. But he was still non-Muslim at that time. So he was in the army of the Mushrikeen. He was trying not to fight. He was trying to keep away from the fight. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ said, if you see any of the people, he said to the companions, if you see any of the people of the family of Abdul Muttalib, don't kill them. Take them as captives. Because they were forced to come with the army of Quraysh. They didn't want to, but they were forced. And this was the case of Al-Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, and Aqil also. So Al-Abbas, all of a sudden Al-Abbas was... Uh, was away, but one of the Ansar tried to get hold of Al-Abbas. He couldn't. But finally he, he got hold of him some way. And he brought him to the Prophet ﷺ and he said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, I have got hold of Al-Abbas. Al-Abbas said, No, by Allah, he did not get hold of me. The one who really got hold of me was a very strong knight, a very strong fighter, soldier, on a strange horse, and he gave a description that matched none of the fighters of the Muslims. But the, uh, the person from Al-Ansar, the Muslim the, from Al-Ansar, he, he insisted that I'm the one who got hold of him. The Prophet ﷺ said to him, you were supported by an angel. You were supported by an angel. And this is an authentic narration. So we can see that once we Muslims do what we can do, Everything we can do, once we do that and we put our trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Allah will give us victory. But today we have fallen short in that and this is why we are suffering today. This is why our situation is not improving. Actually it's deteriorating. So this is why we have to look at ourselves, we have to study our case, we have to define our weaknesses, we have to define where we have went wrong. We have to address these problems. And we have to improve. The way is long. We don't deny that. We admit. The way is long. But we will get there. We will make it there, inshallah, if we work according to the true and authentic knowledge of Islam. If we follow the example of the Prophet ﷺ. If we want an easy way out. If we want to turn all the scales and alter all the scales. Just like that, overnight, it will not work. We will remain in the same situation, if not worse. So we have to understand the rules of change. We have to understand them in order to change. The Prophet ﷺ did not you know, win the battle overnight. He had spent 13 years in Mecca calling the people to Islam, teaching the people about the true aqidah, teaching the people about the reality, about the Lord, about the reality of this life, about the articles of faith, you know, instilling and planting a man in their hearts. And this is what we should do today. And then, the time for victory will come. But we shouldn't be hasty. So that was the case. And now the battle was moving on to the final stages. What do you think the situation of Satan, of Iblis was, of a shaitan? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about this in Surah Al-Anfal. Allah says, وَلَا تَكُونُوا كَالَّذِينَ خَرَجُوا مِنْ دِيَارِهِمْ بَطَرًا وَرِئَاءَ النَّاسِ Allah says to the Muslims, don't be like those people who went out of Mecca with pride and extravagance and arrogance and to show off. Try to give the people the impression that they are strong. الَّذِينَ خَرَجُوا بَطَرًا وَرِئَاءَ النَّاسِ they came out from Mecca to fight the Prophet ﷺ and to fight the religion of Allah. And then Allah talks about Sharaw Zayyana Lahum Shaytanu Aamalahum Wakala La Ghali Balakum Yoma Minan Nas. Wa inni jaru lakum. Shaytan said to them, He said to them that no one can overcome you. Don't worry, you will get victory. No one will overcome you. La Ghali Balakum Yoma Minan Nas. Wa inni jaru lakum and I will support you. I will be your supporter. This is the impression that shaitan gave them. This is why they were so arrogant, so adamant, and so sure about victory. But they didn't get it. When the two armies came against each other, shaitan ran away. He turned back on his heels, ran away. He said, he said, I'm free from you. He said to the mushrikeen, I'm free from you. I see things you cannot see. 
He saw the angels, he realized that victory was going to come from Allah. He said, I fear Allah, I fear Allah, I know that they will win the battle. And this is what shaitan does to people. He always uh, gets the people to do something wrong. He whispers and he gets the people, he pulls their legs to fall into something wrong. And once you fall in that wrong, he will leave you alone. And this is what will happen to the wrongdoers. This is what will happen to the kuffar and the sinners on the day of judgment. Shaitan will beautify sin to them, but on the day of judgment he will leave them alone. He will say, I'm free from you. Yes, I whispered, I got you into that, I duped you into that, but I have nothing to do with you. You're responsible for your own actions. And that was the case exactly. And that was what happened on the battle of Badr. Shaitan ran away and was totally disappointed and was taken by sadness because of what had happened because the Muslims won the battle. Now, the rest of the mushrikeen saw their leaders, saw the great men of Quraysh dead, being killed. They saw, they realized, and others were captivated. They realized they lost the battle. Their morale was destroyed. They ran away. Some of them into the mountains, some of them ran away to Mecca, some of them in the desert, ran away. They couldn't stand. They, they, couldn't, they didn't have any patience to stand in the face of the Muslims. They ran away because they had no message to fight for in the first place. And the battle came to an end. The Prophet ﷺ stood. He contemplated the scene. The land full with bodies of the people of the mushrikeen, 70 casualties. 70 people were killed of the mushrikeen, 70 were captivated. That was the final tally, the final result of the battle. What did the Prophet ﷺ do after that? How did the Muslims behave? These are things we will try to discuss when you join us next time. Until then, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allah knows what's best for us, so why should we complain? We always want the sunshine, but He knows there must be rain. We always want the laughter and the merriment of cheer. But our hearts will lose their tenderness If we never shed a tear So whenever we feel that Everything's going wrong It is just Allah's way To make our spirits strong Ribbons of cheer, but our hearts will lose their tenderness if we never shed a tear. So, whenever we feel that everything's going wrong, it is just Allah's way to make our spirits. Wrong.